Today on Coding 101, we are reviewing outputting lists. We're going deeper into sorting, and it's tuples time. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Coding 101 is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This episode of Coding 101 is brought to you by Hover.com. Hover is the best way to buy and manage domain names. It's simple, honest, and easy to use. For 10% off your first purchase, go to Hover.com and enter promo code C101. And by Lynda.com. Learn what you want when you want with access to over 2,400 high-quality online courses and training videos, all for one low monthly price. To try it free for seven days, visit Lynda.com slash C101. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash C-101. Waka, 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 wow! <laughs> Welcome to Coding 101. It's the show here on Twit where we let you into the world of the elite code monkey. I'm Father Robert Ballas here. And I'm Shannon Morris. And for the next 30 minutes, we are going to get you all coded up on everything you need to know to be a code warrior. Uh, Shannon, it's getting kind of Potter. sad. We're uh, getting close to the end of the uh, Python module here, no, right? No, don't, don't remind me, man. I know. It, it, can, you know, I, it was me. a good idea at first. I, I remember like saying, oh, yeah, we'll do these eight-week modules and everyone will be happy. But as you get to the end of it, you're like, I'm getting into this language. I don't want to go anywhere. I know. I start learning things. And then <sighs> I'm like, I don't want to stop. Why do we got to stop, man? Isn't that? Yeah, it's true. It, it takes like four weeks just to get to the mode where you're, you're like <laughs> no starting kidding. to absorb the knowledge. Oh, okay. Speaking of absorbing the knowledge, yeah. we, uh, we had some uh, decent lessons last week. Uh, do oh, you, my you got something for Snubs compiled? We did. We, we were reviewed everything that we absolutely could last week and we also went through some sorting we also did some uh, sorts of alphabetical lists and then we outputted that list to a file so I have my program this week Ooh. right here I'm gonna go ahead and open it for you so this is my wedding RSVP list so it's the same one that you saw a couple of weeks ago basically has all the names and then it outputs those into a file but they aren't in alphabetical order so that's not gonna help my venue very much right right so I hit enter to continue and it alphabetizes the list at the very end you'll see it says guests are now sorted alphabetically in a new file press enter to exit so I hit exit and then I go down here and there's a new file called Shannon Wright and this has my Bam. list of people alphabetized. Now, they aren't separated right now. I know I need to add, I think, a slash N somewhere in there, which I'll figure that out. But, right, right. <laughs> but it does have the alphabetized list, so it worked. Well, so this, and Dale helped me with it. Thank you exactly. so much, Dale. <laughs> this, this is what I like about this. So you've got the raw code. I mean, you've got the function working. Yeah, yeah. Now you can go back and say, you know what? I want this to look pretty. I can pretty. make it pretty. I want it to be comma delineated. I can add a whole bunch more guests if I wanted to, because there's no end to how many, how many are in that range. So I could do as many as I wanted who if I want if I want exactly it's yeah. fun yeah and, and once you've got that it's the circle of life in programming it's once a total once you have a life. way to pull data in from a disparate source so a text file yes process it in some way and then push it back out into again a text file a disparate source that I can push to something else you you really do have a complete program I mean it, it actually does something Useful. Something useful, and that's totally why I love doing this show. And I also wanted to show a couple of fan submissions as well that we got on the Google Plus community. Uh, the first one was from Daniel. We showed his last week, so I'm not going to show it again, but go over there, download his example. This is a perfect uh, product of what you can do by inputting information out of a couple of text files and then outputting it into a very organized text file that you can actually use. Yay, usefulness. Now, the other one I wanted to show is from Daryl. So if I go back over to my file directory, so this one's from Daryl. He first has this interesting little memory Whoa. database. Yeah, it's so weird. It's a text file. So there's just a bunch of information in here, okay? Isn't that crazy? Okay, well, yeah. obviously so he has a bit of extra Python knowledge. All right, so I just made that into a text file so I could download it. And then I created a Python file. So if I click on the Python file, so basically what it's taking and doing, and this one does not output into a text file, this one just takes information from memory. So it has Padre, Shannon, Daryl, and Timmy. Timmy. Oh, Timmy. 
and it sorts them by name, by age, and by zip code. And I love how he organized it in this code so that each one is uh, indented. So it's a very nice organized file of information and it kind of gives you a nice little uh, spreadsheet almost. So if I hit enter to close, I'm gonna go ahead and show you what his code looks like. So it's a little bit advanced, but he has a lot of notes in here. So read the notes, it's very helpful. But basically he has name.list.txt, and then he has this list of people, their ages, and then their zip code, whatever that might mm -hmm. be. I think he's from Europe, given it's four digits in the zip code. And then it outputs that information into the organized lists for you by age, by zip code, and by name. It's fantastic. Yeah. Now, what I like about this is this is actually touching on something that we're going to be talking a little bit about today when we get a bit deeper into lists and when we get oh into tuples. Boy. Yeah, because remember, the whole idea of having something like a list and the reason why it's more useful than, say, just a variable, like yeah. a variable called test, is because it allows us to group together data. Remember? Oh, that, yeah, absolutely. Super important, right? Yes. Yeah, it, it's, it's one thing to have of, of each person in your in your reception party having their own variable in order to carry their name and then one to carry their age and one to carry their table yeah, but course. when we can actually start grouping together useful information like name and table and age or in food preference and we make that all oh, once of perfect exactly. and then i could group them depending on who i'm sending the information to it's if it's for my photographer i'll sort them by who are family members who i need to be photographed if it's to my venue i could sort them by uh what table numbers and what food group that they decided to choose yeah oh so fun oh by the way we got uh kyle, kyle potts in the chat room who's saying notepad to program Actually, yes. This is one of the reasons why we chose Python. The last language that we did, C Sharp, required a pretty complicated developer environment. Yes. Python is nice because you can use Notepad. Yeah. You can use V. It's, you could use Emacs. Whatever you want. That's what I've been doing so far, and I just add .py to the end, and that's how I save the file. It's, yeah. it's very easy for me to write into Notepad. The only issue that I've been uh, come across a couple of times is whenever I have an error, it doesn't yeah. tell you where that error is yeah. because yeah. it closes too fast yeah. for you. It errors out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you'll have to go back and figure out where that error is yeah. yourself. And the other thing about using uh, just any sort of text editors, remember that Python is ex extremely white space sensitive. Yes. It's not like C Sharp where as long as you end the line with the proper uh, comma delineator, it'll, it'll end the line and move on to the next. Python looks at where things are indented. It looks at where things are placed in the page. So if you do use a text editor that's not Notepad or one of the standards, just make sure that it's not adding a bunch of extra control characters or spaces. Yeah, absolutely. I ran into that problem too. <laughs> <laughs> Which is good, right? Oh, I should show you my code for my example yes, though. Please. Let me run over here back to my folder because um, I did have a question for our audience. Um, I wanted to find out what they thought of my code. There we go, slash idle. All right, so here's my code for my example that I decided to show off. This is the wedding RSVP list. First, I opened and read the file, and then I sorted them right here, and this is just a simple sort list. And at the very end, I outputted that sorted list into a file. Now, I know that I have to add, add that slash in. I think it goes right here, but I'm pretty sure I, Maybe I need quotes here. I'll have to look that up. I'll have to research that a well, little we'll more. Well, we'll fix it. We'll yeah. make it right. So I want to ask you guys to fix that for me. <laughs> Actually, yeah, that's a, that's a good homework. This will be in the GitHub, so go in there and fix Shannon's code. Yes, it will be. <laughs> yeah, and also make it pretty. Yeah, make it pretty. Yeah, menus and everything. make it pretty. Go ASCII crazy. Menus? Really? Yeah, ASCII? Why not? Why not? They can do okay, it. Okay, do it. They're smart. Have fun. <laughs> now, when we come back, we're going to be getting a little deeper into some of those data thingies, structures, like lists, and tuples that we were talking about. Exactly. Yeah, we're going to get into Tupperware. Tupperware, sorry. I always mess that Welcome up. Welcome to the Tupperware party. Exactly. It, it, it keeps your data fresh. <laughs> No. 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 <laughs> no. Wow, wow. That's, that's a big We sad, hear a wah wah from the sad audience. Sad trombone. But you know what's not a sad trombone? What? Hover. Oh. Yeah. So one of the sponsors. <laughs> okay. Hover <laughs> does not get sad trombone. What is wrong with you, Brian? <laughs> totally on top of this. You have way too many buttons. <laughs> but seriously, so, you know, we, we here are all about the interwebs, right? We yeah, like absolutely. ourselves some interwebs. I love the interwebs. And in order to have I'm a presence. Interweb citizen. Yeah, exactly. We're both citizens of the interwebs. Yes. But you know what you need? Like your passport to be the traveling through the interwebs? Oh, what's that? A domain. 
Oh yeah, you need a domain. Yeah. Definitely. Now there are a lot of fly-by now outfits. You know, you know them. I'm not going to have to mention them. I don't want to mention them. But uh, you really want someone who you can trust before you trust them with your domain. I mean, this is your your identity online. You want to make sure it's done right, which is why we're so happy to have Hover on Coding 101. Now, you want to secure that domain. You want something catchy and memorable to represent your online identity. Well, Hover gives you exactly what you need to get that job done. You'll find the perfect domain for your idea so you can get started working on it and move on to the next thing on your to-do list. In other words, don't spend all your time figuring out how you're going to get that domain you want. Just go to Hover, buy it, be done, and start creating. Now, people love Hover. When you're looking for the best place to register a domain name, you ask the people who know a lot about domains, like Snubs and myself. Geeks, developers, designers, and programmers all love Hover because they know that they'll have the best tools and support. But you don't have to be an expert to get a domain. Their service is simple enough to use that you'll be comfortable figuring it out yourself. And the support team is always ready to give you a hand. Now, Hover takes all the hassle and friction out of registering a domain. It gives you an easy-to-use, powerful tool UI to manage your domain so that you can do it, well, just in your pajamas. You can get the perfect domain name and start building your web presence right away to take control of what people find when they search for you or your online business. Now, if you wanted to use Hover, it's easy. All you have to do is search for, for a few keywords, and Hover will show you the best available options and suggestions. Hover has a clean and simple website. In less than five minutes, you can find the domain name you want and get it up and running. And they've got a huge variety of domain extensions like .com, .net, and country codes that best suit your needs so you can get just about anything. Now, here's the big thing for me. Hover is honest. They don't believe in heavy-handed upselling. They're not going to make you get this package or that package when you buy your domain. They tell you what it's going to cost, and that's exactly how much it's going to cost. They include everything that you need with your domain, no more and no less. Plus, who is privacy is included free on every domain that supports it. Now, if you ever need a hand, Hover is, well, just a phone call and an email away. They've got the best customer support, hands down. They're known for its no wait, no hold, no transfer phone service. And when you call, you actually get a real live person. How about that? Now, what got me excited is that Hover actually has a lot of the new TLDs, including the dot .club. Now, you don't have to settle for something that's less than perfect anymore by adding a dash or dropping a letter. Anyone who's tried to register a domain nowadays knows how difficult it is to get something like in the dot .com, dot .net, or dot .org space. You always have to find a freaky spelling. Well, don't do that. Instead, get a .club. It's perfect for any kind of club or social group, for a country club, a book club, a sports club, even Facebook groups. There are so many applications for .club, and they're descriptive. .club has its meaning built into it, which means people will know what your website is about. Your domain can be shorter by eliminating that club from the actual domain name, and they've got a lot of them available. You have a better chance of getting your name so you can get rid of all those dashes or words that you didn't want there in the first place. So here's what we want you to do. We want you to visit Hover.com to register your domain name and get 10% off your first purchase. All you have to do is go to Hover.com and use our promo code C101. That's Hover.com and our promo code C101. And we thank Hover for their support of Coding 101. Woot! Yatta! Woohoo! No. Let's do some more now. Let's do some more. So, we gotta talk a little, uh, little, little something, something before we can little get into tubbles. Song. A little something, something. Okay. Now what there are, are there are actually a few things that I think we should probably review before we get into tubbles. It's it's always wow. good to to go back through some of the material that we've covered, oh starting with um, well, a question from Ted Bingham who asked. Why do certain chipsets support certain languages? This was actually something I found oh. on Twitter. This is actually a good question, That's right? That's a really good question. Right, you always hear about, oh, well, this, the, use Python if you're programming for the Raspberry yeah. Pi, and C Sharp's really good for Windows on an x86. And he wanted to know, you know, basically, well, do you have to use C Sharp if you're on an x86 processor? Do you no, have to use Python? If you're, yeah, it, here's the thing. It's not bound by the processor. The, the way that compilers or interpreters work, like the one that allows C Sharp to work or the one that allows Python to work, is it takes that language, everything that we write, and it converts it into machine code. Mm -hmm. you know, some, normally, right. binaries or an executable, the ones and zeros that the processor can actually understand. Yes. Or, or at least the operating system can understand. So when we talk about a, 
a compiler or an IDE or an interpreter being tied to a specific processor, it's not because that processor speaks Python or that processor speaks C Sharp. It's because the compiler has been designed so it will convert the language into the machine code for that specific processor. Uh -huh. Does I that make it. sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, it's we get a lot of people who are confused about that because yeah. they think that uh, you know when I type in print in Python that it means that the the processor actually understands what print is. So it has no clue. The com the interpreter for Python actually has to turn that into something that the OS can read and then can push to the the, the processor, the machine level. That would make sense given the name of these things are compilers. Compilers, interpreters, right, right. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, it's a, a little bit of basic knowledge and, and Ted, thank you so very much for asking it because I think that's something that a lot of people were wor uh, wondering about. Theoretically, if you wanted to, you could take something like C Sharp and you could recompile the compiler so that it would work on every type of processor. Right. We just typically don't do that because that's boring. <laughs> We won't do that on this we show. <laughs> we, won't do, we won't do that on the show. All right, now let's let's get it. Let's get to a little something something. Yes. We know about lists, right? We've been playing a lot with lists. Yes. Well, we I have love lists. We have a way of so printing fun. from lists, right? We've been using this. If you go ahead and go to my computer, this is the method that we've been using to print. So we've got yeah. this list called podcasters. It's filled with Leo, Lisa, Padre, Snubs, Brian, OMG, Chad, and then one, two, three, four. That's our newest. Uh, Podcast. One, two, three, four. One, yeah, two, he's three, four. great. He's awesome. Yeah, he's gonna be he's gonna be taking my place. And then we've been using a for loop, right? Uh, yes. We just we go through this 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 uh, list and we say print the list and then the entry number in the list. And as it goes from zero to seven, it will go through all the different entries within that list, and you get this. Boom, it prints up everything that's in the list, right? Yes, exactly. Okay. From the very first one all the way to the end. All the way to the end. And so this is what we've been using when we've been wanting to print from a list. This works, and this is good, and actually I like this doing it this way because it, it does make you use for loops, but there's actually an easier way that I want to show you right now, Ooh. and that's to do this. Oh. Remember that a list really just looks like a variable to, to yeah. Python. So I have the same thing. I've got my list with all those people, and instead of using a for loop, I'm just going to say print podcasters. I'm just going to say print the list. Now, do you think you know what this is going to look like? Will it look exactly the same? Almost. It'll look like this. So when I print in this... One? Oh, one line. Yeah, so it's, it's got them all in oh. one line. So basically all it did is it, it did a dump of everything that was in the list. Right. Right? So it will give you the same results in that you'll see what's inside the list, but the format is slightly different. Yeah, it even includes the brackets and the little quotes. Right, right. It, it's it's literally, it's literally printing everything that's in that list. <laughs> so so it doesn't know that that's actually telling you that it's a range. Right. It's just it's why? just dumping. It's dumping everything. So if the list is a memory address, mm -hmm. saying print the list actually just dumps that memory address on the screen. <laughs> Whereas if we use the for loop, we're pulling each individual element out of each piece of that list and Got printing it. it to screen. That's cool. It's kind of cool, right? Yeah. You know, it, it looks a little easier, but it's not as pretty. Exactly. Exactly. It's not as pretty. And also, remember, we the reason why we wanted you to to uh, to do it with a for loop is because you could add things to that for loop to, to right. play with the elements, right? Yes. If I'm just printing out the memory dump of the list, I, I, there's not a whole lot I can do. It, it shows me what's in there, but beyond that, not really useful. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's the uh, second way to do print. What we also wanted to do is we wanted to show you uh, the way that we've been doing sort. So this is this is our sorts, right? We've got a list called sort me. It's filled with all these numbers. Uh, we've, we've seen this example before. And then I'm using a for uh, loop to go ahead and print what's in that list. Right. And then I run the dot, the dot sort function. Remember this? Yes, I yeah. do. So all we have to do is we do sort, and we add that function, we append it to the name of the list, okay. and it will do a destructive. It's called an in-place sort. So it's wow. going to reorder the list called sort me with the reordered list. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, so so here, here's what it looks like. The first time it runs, it's just going to print what was inside that list, what I gave it, 1, 23, 6, 4, 99, right? Mm -hmm. So when I press Enter, it now shows me, oh, it's all been sorted. One, right. four, six, twenty-three, ninety-nine. Okay. But here's the thing. What I've just done is I have overwritten the list called sort me. So that oh. it's been destroyed. It's been destroyed in favor of the list that is sorted. Oh, 
Oh. It's a destructive that's sword. That's so weird. Right, right. We don't, that's good. Sometimes it's good. If you don't care what's going on with the original uh, array, then that's, that's great. But we can do a non-destructive oh, sword. Oh, what is going on here? All right, so <laughs> we've, got, we've got the same thing. We've got a, a list here called podcasters, filled okay. with all, those, all those, uh, uh, those podcasters. And then you just print that. Right, I'm just going to print it, it to show you what's in there. Yeah. Right? Now I'm going to sort it, but I'm going to sort it two different ways. So I'm going to use, not sort, but I'm going to use the function called sorted. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say this new list, this new list called sorted podcasters, mm -hmm will be equal to, so it's going to be filled with the value of the list called podcasters, but sorted. Okay. Okay. The reason why we're doing this is it's going to keep the original list while also giving me a sorted list. Ah, okay. So right? it's not destroying it in the process. It's not, right. This is not an in-place sort. It's not okay. a destructive sort. It's a sort that gets pushed into a new list. So that's when I cool. run this, I get this. So that's just the dump, right? Yes. Okay. So go ahead and, oh, so hit enter. Now I get two. I get the original list, okay. which, see, matches up to what you see at the top. Yes. But I also get the sorted list, which is now oh, wow. sorted alphabetically, right? That's cool. The, now, the cool thing about this is I now have two copies of that list. So if I ever wanted to go back and compare lists, I could say I've got the pre-sort and the post-sort list. So I want to run through the rest of your code for this okay. so I can see the differences. All right. Oh, well, I got to look over here. There we go. Okay. Okay, so first you have print podcasters. Right. And then you have print sorted podcaster. Oh, yeah, that's easy. Very easy, right? Okay. Yeah, so... So the first time it prints the podcasters, the original list, and then the second time it prints sorted podcasters, that new right. variable that you made. And this is the key line right here. So the key line is yeah. sorted podcasters is equal to sorted podcasters. Perfect. Right? Okay. So what I've done is... I'm not changing the original list. The original list called podcasters stays the same. Yeah. But I've run the function called sorted on it, which doesn't destroy the original list. It just pushes those values to a new list called sorted podcasters. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's actually another way that you, you can manipulate data. It's, it's very useful. Very easy. All right, so now let's, uh, let's do a little something something. In the previous example, what we did was we pushed the sorted list into a new list, right? Yes. Well, there are going to be some cases where you don't want a brand new list. You just want it sorted at that moment, and then you don't care about the sorted values anymore. Yeah. In Python, you can actually do this. I can use the sorted function, and I can print it. Oh. So what this does is, again, I've got the same, I'm always using the same list here, people, the same list called podcasters. Now I'm going to print that list sorted. Print podcaster sorted. Okay, right. cool. And so what this will give me is this. So Got it. Right? That's exactly what I thought it would look like. Exa yeah, exactly. Cool. So that, now the cool thing about that is I didn't have to create another variable. I don't have another piece of memory that's being used up by a list. Somewhere. <laughs> this is just, pr it just prints it, and then after it's done printing, it goes away. That's cool. Okay. okay. All right. Nice and easy. Nice and easy. Now let's get to something that maybe people won't feel is so easy. We're talking about tuples. Okay, tuples. Okay. So this is a real thing, you're not this, just making I'm this up. I'm not making this up. This is, I, I do want to know who came up with the name tuple. It tuples. is, it's kind of cool. I love it's it. It's like quintuples. Tuple, I, I like tuples. tupleware. Tupleware. Tupleware is my big fan. Tuplets. All right, so if you look at the screen, what we have here is what a tuple looks like. A tuple almost looks like a list. Right. There's one subtle thing. Instead of a bracket, I'm using a parenthesis. Yeah. Right? Okay. Okay. The, here's the other thing about a tuple. These are, uh, these are indelible. You cannot change them. Oh, okay. A tuple is permanent. I okay. create it. Once you create that tuple, unless you want to destroy the record, you can't change what's in it, okay. which has its own uses, right? So you've got semi-permitted information. In this particular example, I've created three different tuples. So again, remember, every kind of variable, be it a list, an array, or just a straight up string or an integer, looks the same in Python. In this particular case, I'm creating a tuple called tuppy1. Tuppy one. And I'm filling it with those six numbers. Okay. In the sec second instance, I'm creating tuppy2, and I'm filling it with these strings. Got in it. the third case, I'm creating one called tuppy3, and notice how I didn't use parentheses. Instead, I used you a used semi quotes. Yeah, a semicolon. I said a semicolon at the end, right? Now, when I print this, it, exactly like you think, it's just going to print exactly what was in those tuples. Okay. Okay? 
Yeah. Easy, right? Yeah, looks easy enough. Easy enough. Okay, good. So that's basic tuples. And again, the reason why we want to use this is anytime we have groups of information that we want to stay together and that we don't want them to change. Okay. Right? We want to make them permanent. All right. So now let's go ahead and move from that to this. Ooh. All right. So we know about lists. Yes, we do. We know about tuples. Yes. Now, how about a list of tuples? Oh, boy. This is actually perfect for you because when is you it? start talking about your, your reservations, yeah. what are you gonna have? You're gonna have name, you're gonna have like age, you're gonna yes. have all the, well, this is like a list of lists, but this is a list of tuples. Go ahead and go back to my screen, mm -hmm. Brian, and let me show you what I'm talking about. I am creating a list called TwitTuples. Okay. And I'm gonna fill it with three tuples. Ooh. The first one is Padre, my name, Twyatt, which is the name of the show I host, and 72, which is my age. <laughs> and then it's filled with you, Snubs, and you host Coding 101, filled with your age, 22. Right. And yeah. then it's filled with Brian, he hosts Know How, and his age is six. <laughs> Obviously. Right, exactly. So what I've done is I've created a list that actually contains three tuples. Interesting. And uh, the reason why I do this is to show you, just like we started at the, at the beginning of the lesson, it's really easy to print what's in here. All I have to do is say print the name of the list, and the list is Twit Tuples. And if I go ahead and run this, it's just gonna print it out. Okay. Right? Yeah. Okay. So far, interesting, not useful. Not useful at all, really. <laughs> Here's where it gets useful. So, uh, you know, I've got so many shells open right now. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sort it. Ooh. So same thing, I've got, all this is what you just saw. It's going to create a list filled with tuples. It's going to create the, the tuples with name, show, and, and age. But then it's gonna do this. Remember the sorted oh, function we just played yeah, with? Yeah, yeah. It's going to say print the sorted version of twit tuples. Of twit oh, tuples. I see the key lambda. Key. What yeah. is that? Okay. This, this is where it gets useful. What we are now doing is we can direct using a key how it sorts. Oh, that's cool. So uh, the user can input something. Well, no, no, the, you, well no. right here, I get to tell it. How, how it's gonna sort. So I'm saying you're, you're gonna use the Lambda key. Oh. And actually, it's very easy. If you, have, if you just go to the Python documentations and you can see all of the keys that you can possibly use. I'll go back to my code. It's, it's gonna use the Lambda key against twit2. And what that's saying is go to the third field, because remember, it starts at zero. So, so the zero, 72, one, two. 22, and the six. Right, and it's gonna say sort by the third field, what? which is age. So it's what it's gonna do. It's gonna sort by Age. That's cool. So if I print, if I run this, now it's 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 uh, reordered everything yeah. so that it sorts it by order of age uh, in descending order. Wow. Yeah. And I can use that key on the second field. I could use it on the first field. This is where this is where sorts really become useful because once I've got a collection of data, I could say sort it by name. Yeah. Now sorted by show. <laughs> now sorted by age. Yes. Now sorted by ascending or descending order. And that's all that's in aw the key. Wow, I can totally see how this would be really, really useful for my list of people that right. are coming to the web. Exactly. Because now it, it, ex great. it extends what you can do. It's not just, well, I, I sorted. That's the only thing I could do now. Sort it up, sort it down, sort it by name, sort it by age, sort it that's by the table awesome. you put them on, as long as you put everything in the right oh, list. I'm so structure. glad you went over lambdas because I was like, what the? Like, why do you use that in code? I don't understand. Yeah, yeah. Well, th life. this is uh, this is all useful information, but uh, yes. you know, one of the things that we really wanted to do uh, when we come back is we wanted to talk to our code warrior about how we get other packages in the Python. We've taken you through some of the basics, but what would be awesome is if he'll show us how we could take pre-written packages and use them to extend our programming masterstroke. Ooh, yeah. but I'm before that, that, you know what? I think there's something that I want to mention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know what, I, what I'm feeling? I'm feeling like this is all good, but I would you wanna love. You want to learn? I would love to learn more. You I would learn some more? Yeah, we give people little bits and pieces. We but, do. But let's say I actually wanted to learn Python from the beginning, the way it's designed to be taught. I know the exact spot that you can go to. Where? Lynda.com. Nice. Yeah, they've got over 2,400 courses, and they're adding new ones every single week from people that are passionate in their fields of service. They do videos for everything from 
Python to Java to beginner programming to iOS programming. Everything that you could ever want and ever need on that website is there. And there are courses from everybody from beginners to intermediate to really, really advanced stuff in case you feel like, oh, you know, I already know the beginner stuff. I can skip this. And you can watch from your computer, your tablet, or your mobile device in case, you know, you're on the go all the time like I am. I'm commuting every single day, so I watch this stuff. Well, I listen to it, excuse me, while I'm driving. I listen to it on my way to work. Very, very easy and very fun. And these people really like to do these videos. So you're not going to watch, you know, it's not going to be something that is homemade on YouTube like you would find sometimes. Lynda.com helps you keep up to date with software, learn brand new skills, and you can explore new hobbies with easy to follow video tutorials. So whether you want to master the fundamentals of programming or learn a new programming language like Python, or build your first iOS app, Lynda.com offers thousands of courses in a variety of topics. So you can learn how to program software and applications with hundreds of courses on widely used programming language like PHP, Objective-C, and Java. At lynda.com, you can learn hundreds of courses on web design and development skills. Everything from the web fundamentals and mobile development to responsive web design and user experience. Interested in creating an app for multiple platforms? Well, lynda.com is the place to go. They created a playlist for building a cross-platform mobile app that is available now at lynda.com slash c101. Yay! And lynda.com just released a course on getting up and running on asp.net. So you can explore asp.net, including the structure behind robust asp.net applications and the tools that you need to manage data, construct APIs, and establish real-time web connections. You got to check this out. lynda.com works with software companies to provide you updated training the same day new versions hit the market. So you'll always have the very latest skills. And you can add certifications to your LinkedIn profile, which is super cool if you're looking for a new job and you need to have those kind of certifications for that said job. So it's only 25 bucks a month for access to the entire lynda.com course library. Or for $37.50 a month, you can subscribe to the premium plan. That's what I was doing for a long time, which includes exercise files that let you follow along with the instructor's project using the exact same project assets that they do. Extremely helpful, especially if you're more of a homework person like I am. So you can download everything you need right there. And you can try lynda.com free for seven days for a free trial. You can visit lynda.com slash c101 to access the entire library. That's over 2,400 courses free for seven days. Do it now. That's lynda.com slash c101. And we thank lynda.com for their support of Coding 101. Thank you guys. We love you. Do it now. Do it now. Now. Do it now. Okay. Now, <laughs> now we also have, we have people in the chat room I know who are fighting over the pronunciation of tuple. Uh, it's like GIF and JIF. Find the pronunciation that you like and go with it. Yep, that's now, right. Now, Shannon, this is the time of the show where we typically bring in someone who actually knows what he's doing, right? I think we do. Yeah. Who now, could it be? Who could it be? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the show, our code warrior, the man who knows. Mr. Dale Chase from Discovery <laughs> Digital Networks. Dale, so good to see you again. How are you? What's up, Dale? How are you, how are you doing, guys? Uh, awesome. So, so I'm I'm the one who knows what he's doing. <laughs> yes, that's you how do. it works. You do. You always know what you're doing. Oh, by the way, so we got to ask you, how do you pronounce? How do you properly pr pronounce tuple? I don't know how you properly. I pronounce it tuple. <sighs> tuple. You know what? You can't say tupleware. I think it's one of those <laughs> things where it, it depends on where you grew up and the way that you grew up. Tuple, I like tuple. Tuple. Jif. Tuple gif, sounds cute. Asp. Yeah, yeah, tuple yeah. sounds pretentious. <laughs> tu tu tuple is how they pronounce it in tuple. Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> and if you mispronounce it in Brooklyn, they will break your knees. <laughs> now, now, Dale, Dale, everything that we've been doing in this in this module, this seven weeks of this module, has been based on the programming that you have been doing. You've been giving us our master code each and every single week. It's what we teach to. It's what we show the people. It's the example that we give to every code monkey who wants to get on his way, his or her way. Sorry. Yes, that's right. To uh, to Code Warrior Stardom, but uh, you wanted to do something a little different today. It's not really a coding project. It's more of a knowledge project. You want to hit us with it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, cause a lot of the fun that I have had, you know, learning how to code was like, 
uh, grabbing other package, grabbing packages that added functionality to the language that I was working in uh, to help me have more fun with it. And a lot of and something that I had a lot of fun with early on was like coding my own games. Uh, so I thought it might be fun to uh, show folks how to install uh, a third party package that would allow them to have like 2D, 3D graphics functionality. Oh my uh, no, no I'm that. not interested in that at all. I don't, <laughs> Are I don't. you kidding me? Padre, this is awesome. Okay, okay. Well, just break it down for a second because I, I, some people may not understand exactly how significant that was. Most of us, if we think about programming a video game, it's a freaking nightmare because I don't want to have to create all the code to make sprites and scary. collision detection. But and he said you can download that. Exactly. What, what is this? Why would I be able to download this? Um, yeah, this is, uh, I mean, I'm not actually, I actually haven't had much experience with this particular package. I just thought it looked pretty cool. Um, I found actually a, a video on YouTube of someone actually creating uh, a mine, a Minecraft uh, clone using, no. uh, yeah, this library called, uh, uh, Piglet. I mean, we could get uh, away from what? Java. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it's not, multi, you know, this, it's Python. I mean, so it's like, it, it's multi-platform, but, you know, there are certain things you have to consider. But I figured it would be a, a nice, fun way to kind of continue to learn, you know, Python within your own sort of uh, environment, right. you know. Um, probably not being able to do much more with it, you know, without uh, going through some going through a fashion, you know. But uh, and nice to help you learn to continue programming, I think. Now, now, Dale, we've already talked about using functions that we haven't written, right? I mean, just bringing them into your program so you can call on them, or even using the built-in functions in Python. We've also talked about using the API from something like YouTube so that you could use programming across the web. You could, you could query them with, uh, with, uh, with queries, and they bring you back information, uh, no matter what you're doing, as long as you're following the API standards. How is this different? I mean, this, this is not a, another function. This is not an API. This is an entire package that you bring into yeah, the programming th environment. Yeah, this is pre-written source code so that you, you know, you know, it makes creating shapes and that sort of thing and coloring screens and whatnot just uh, super easy you know, or, or easier than uh, doing it from a, a much lower level. Uh, this kind of gives you this, this is a pre-written functions, essentially, that let that gives you more functionality in Python. Okay, I'm sold. So I uh, I love the fact that I can do this. Can you actually show me what I would have to do to to bring a package into my environment? Okay. Well, in this instance, uh, uh, in general, it's pretty simple. Uh, in this instance, uh, we're just going to go to pyglet p y g l e t dot org and uh, go to their downloads page. And since we're using Python two seven. We are going to use actually their their alpha build here um, from their latest top repository version because uh, we oh wait not that oh, no, yeah. we we need it we needed to run in 32 bit mode and not 64 or is it the other way around I know I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah no yeah this runs in 64 bit mode not 32 um, so I'm going to grab here we are here this uh, one dot two alpha one here and just download this uh, you don't have any reservations about using alpha code um generally yeah if, if this is not going to be something that we're going to distribute you know for sale kind of just something we're going to have some fun with and uh and gen yeah, generally I'd, I'd go with a stable version but since their stable version only runs in 32-bit mode for two, python 2.7 I'm going to go with this just for the purpose of this kind of demonstration. Got it. Got it. Um, okay, so, so you've downloaded so, 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 it. And... Yeah, so now I've got that downloaded. That's in my downloads folder. So now we'll just go and, uh, and yes, I am doing this like live. <laughs> so I'm totally on the wild side right now. Oh, uh, snap. So we'll go to my downloads here. And uh, that was, um, what was that file? Pygrad dash. Um, yeah, there we go. One dot two alpha one dot tar. <laughs> so the first thing we have to do is this is a, a compressed file. So the first thing we have to do is unzip it or uncompress it. And I'm going to use a a, a built-in uh, command tar. Uh, and uh, it takes a couple of arguments. Uh, We're doing some command line stuff. <laughs> 
Uh, and so this will just uncompress it and put it right back uh, in the folder where I just, uh, oh, what did I do here? Uh, um, there we go. Oh. And so that just... So these are all the, the Python files that were inside that package. They've just uncompressed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uncompressed and uh, kind of... For anyone that's never in, used a tar.gz, put them in a folder for me here. It's pretty much like a zip. Yeah. Like yeah, a zip file. Yeah. You just find the right Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So installing this now is actually uh, relatively simple uh, if all goes as it should. All I do now is uh, go into that directory, that folder that was just created. And uh, the command that we want to run. And uh, so uh, on a Unix system, uh, you'll probably want to use uh, another command called sudo to make right. sure you are uh, exactly running as administrator to make sure it has all the right privileges. Uh, and so we'll just go sudo python setup.py. And then we want to run the command install. Um, you can also add to this if you're concerned about uninstalling it later. Um, actually, I meant to have this ready, but there's another uh, uh, thing you can append here uh, called record, and then uh, some flags for that. That'll let you put a text file in this folder, which keeps a record of all the, the files that it's putting in, and then you can just reference that when, it, when you want to install it. Um, but uh, that you can easily find information on that if you want to go that far. Um, but simply, the, just the bare bones is just to do sudo python set up py install. Uh, and I'll put in my password. His password is I love cats. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Close. And now it's uh, installed. Yeah. And, if, and you, so, if you've ever played with a Linux system or if you've ever played with a Raspberry Pi, you know what this is. Yeah. You yeah. know how to do this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's, a comp it's compiling your library and it's giving you something you can actually right. use. And I can prove this, and hopefully I can prove this. So now if I go into actually my Python interpreter or um, uh, thing here, uh, I just do – so we have our import command that we uh, – you'd, you'd see us use right. in a few episodes. Mm -hmm. uh, so That's now I can actually two. do that live here. Right. Uh, so I can just say uh, import Pyglet, and if it is in here, I will not get an error. Cross fingers. Boom. It worked. Hey. So now Take I can that, go ahead Murphy. and start. <laughs> so now I, I can go ahead and start using the library. Okay. Um, so yeah. Now, so this. Thank you for showing us this because there's going to be some people who are going to freak out when they download this this package and they're not like going to know how to use it. Right. But now we know. We know how how to how to unzip it. We know how to compile it. We know how to make it ready for use. But how do I go from doing that to being able to program my own game? Can you show me how I use this library? Yeah, I can show you. Um, I, I can grab a couple of uh, the example files that they have, and uh, and like and run them and show you just kind of how simple it is to kind of just just get in there. Do that. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, so if we go back to their site, they do have uh, some documentation here. Yeah, you're gonna need the documentation. Yeah. I so within that. Yeah, within that, they have some example files and some some things, I guess, to see if, you know, it'll work correctly. Some tests, uh, some tests that it goes through. Right, right. Uh, so we'll go ahead. I'm just going to go ahead and unzip that normally. Yeah, folks, and uh, while Dale does this, this just shows you that if you ever make a library for someone else to use, please document the heck out of it. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> there, there's there been numerous occasions where I've tried to do some kind of hack or use open source software where there was no documentation. Yeah, it's like, well, I know how to use it. You should be able to figure it out. It's like, no, no, no just <laughs> assume people are stupid and document everything. Exactly. <laughs> All right, so we're going to go into the docs here. Um, let's see. LS. So there's a, I think that's Remake. a folder, right? Yeah. 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 I'm going to open that up. Okay. So here we go. Test.py in here. So I'm going to run this test.py. Python test.py and cross our fingers again. And see what we get. 
Whoa. All right. Okay. So yeah. it's running some tests here and says, okay, so what's going to happen now? It's going to create a small window. Uh, will be opened, colored purple. And uh, and that's the beginning of the test. And so we'll see what happens. Oh, it op looks like it opened up behind, but there yeah. it is. Hi, test. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so all it's doing is it's showing that it can actually use your graphics subsystem. Yeah, yeah. And so now if you want to take a look, and it's going to go on, you know, just kind of doing some tests. Um, a couple of these are kind of interesting. I guess this creates two windows, I think, or just another one. So this is just going to go on. But what we can do is just look at the code. Yeah, let's check it out. See what exactly was going on in there. Yeah. Yeah, and it looks like it's got a bunch of dependencies in here. Um, Whoa. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so this is all... Uh, Oh, that looks the, easy. The, the, the wel yeah, this is all just the welcoming text. Uh, this is all you stuff, it looks right. like. It's the man page. Yeah, oh, so here we go. Here we okay, get so the, some gets, stuff here. Yeah, so it's importing the files from that, from that library that it needs. And then where right. does it actually start using it? So let, let, uh, let, let me break see. that down for you. So let's yeah. say one of our code monkeys does all these steps and gets it properly installed, uh, has the libraries ready to use, and says, OK, I want to create a box a graphical box on my screen, how do I use this library to do it? Where, do I, where would I find that code? Well, all right. Well, let's uh, look at the documentation. Because <laughs> that's really where all that is. I mean, that's... Uh, let's see. All right, we're, 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 let's uh, look specifically at something very specific, one of these other things here. Uh, graphics. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so what it's doing is it's defining. So it's using, the, it's using the, the define function to define certain functions that you can use once you've got this library imported. I like yeah, that. Well, I think, yeah, I think these are just individual examples now. I think that the, the, the test that I ran was kind of an overall, you know, a test your system kind of thing. Now, these are more specific examples that now we kind of look at exactly how this library is used. Uh, so, yeah, so this is kind of bringing in math, some things from math. And then, so here we go. You're importing Pyglet. Um, and then, I guess, from this other sub thing, all of it. Uh, and I guess this is all kind of set up stuff, set up right. window. Right. right. So now in here, that's more window. Well, the important thing here is to remember that. Uh, again, th I, this is looking crazy, right? This is gonna this yeah, is gonna kill some people. Don't it's, expect me to do this next yeah, week. Yeah, you don't expect uh, you to do this next week. But what we do expect is that you understand that everything that you see here, even for the functions that you don't understand what they do, you understand how they work. It's all it's using just the basics. You see for loops. You see variables here. You see mathematical operations, and then all it's done is it's created these functions that you can use. You can use in your program to build on programming that someone else has actually made for you. It's it again. It looks crazy. This is like when we did the API and people were freaking out. It looks ridiculous, but it's it, it, yeah. You get to do stuff like this. That's so cool. Yeah, so that's what that does. <laughs> so, Dale, what was the name of this again? It was Pyglet, you're calling it? Pyglet. Yes, Pyglet. Okay. We'll yeah. make sure to give you links to Pyglet in the show notes so that you can download and install this library. That's we cool. we know that it's this is too much, and, and actually we designed it this way. The last two episodes of any module is going to be the blow Crazy. your hair back stuff, right? But this is the stuff for the experts. That's why in Ivory Tower we gave you some, some additional basics. Go ahead and play with tablets, and yes, I'm still calling them tablets. And if you are a more advanced coder, go ahead and download that library, and we want to see what you can do with it. Absolutely. Dale Chase, Discovery Digital Network. You know, uh, Brian, we've got a little something, something you can play while we uh, while we say thank you to our code warrior, right? Ooh. Oh no. <laughs> Here we go. Hey, My you horrible bring days. the audio down on that a tiny bit. Dale, this this is you in your other life. You're not just a programmer; you're an artist. And you're a fantastic artist. You do nerdcore. Can you tell the folks at home where they can find you, where they can get your work? Yeah, you can uh, get all my music uh, for free right now uh, still at uh, dchase.bandcamp.com. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just moving uh, out right now. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, yeah, you, it's kind of hard not to like listen because it's, it's awesome. It's a good song. <laughs> <laughs> Won't lie. It's a good song. <laughs> uh, 
Wait, can you just turn this up a little bit, Brian? He's so smooth. I know. Got that smooth voice. Yeah, the straight me, no It just sounds so good. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Hold on. Here it comes. Like Here's you for the drop. You don't want to hear this part. You know me. <laughs> okay, you can turn it off now. <laughs> yeah. All right, Dale. That's that's awesome, man. That's awesome. Thank you so very much again for for bringing down the knowledge to uh, to our code monkeys. No doubt, guys. Thank you for having me on. No. Thank you, Dale. I know next week is going to be our last uh, our last Python. Don't say that. Episode. No. So you're gonna you're gonna blow something. You're gonna give it's us something to blow their wigs back, right? I mean, just we're going um, crazy. We're going all out. Just nuts. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess I'll try to have some fun with Piglet and see what I can show you guys. Yes. Fantastic. Dale Chase, Discovery Digital Networks, we love you as always. Thank you for being our Code Warrior. Catch you guys. All right. Peace. Now, folks, uh, we know we gave you a lot of information. A lot. I mean, seriously. Don't we always? A lot. Yeah. That's, but <laughs> that's why happens. we've got show notes. Shannon, you want to tell them about show notes? Sure. Twit.tv slash code is where you can find all the notes, and we do upload all of our code to the GitHub. There's a link on the GitHub. Uh, there's a link to the GitHub at twit.tv, so you can find all of our code. You can copy it and paste it and run it on your own computers. So yeah. have fun. That's the best way to, to play, folks. You just got to learn. You got to poke. You got to break it and That's then right. fix it. And also, don't forget that you can subscribe to Coding 101 on iTunes if you're an iCoder. Now, we want you to spread the word about Coding 101 fi far and wide. We're still gaining audience members by the thousands on every Yay! episode. So thank you thank so you. much, everyone. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. very, very much. Make sure people know that they, they got to learn about coding. If Even if you don't want to be a coder, you have to understand how the tools that you use every day are programmed like by geeks you know like I'll us. be honest it really it really does help when you understand even just you look at coding you say oh that's obviously C sharp right it helps if you ever run into problems downloading something or exporting documents or right. whatever totally it absolutely it does helps. yeah now you know it's not just iTunes and the show notes page that no. they can find us on. We are on YouTube as well. YouTube.com slash TwitCoding101. You can go over there, subscribe to our channel, please do it, and also comment below on whatever you like about the show, and I read all those comments, by the way. She does. She's really good about it. I do. You, you can also <laughs> find us on G+. We're actually almost at 1,000 members. Help us to get to 1,000 members by the end of the Python module. We just need, what was oh, that? We need wow. like 12. 12. Give us 12 members. Oh gosh, Come on, so go close. get 12 people to join the community. Now, this community isn't just a place where we hang out. You find in there some really, really good programmers. In oh, fact, yeah. I am betting. That, that one at the top. Yeah, look at he that. He figured out how to download the daily, uh, I think it was the Hubble Space Telescope oh. picture. Isn't that cool? I mean, talk about taking data from an external Amazing. source and turning it into something useful. So Boom. Cool. Folks, if you want to know the more advanced techniques of the programming masters, be sure to join our G Plus group. And, and where can they find that, Shannon? gplus.to slash twitcoding101. Uh, I think we also got the actual name now from Google, which is plus.google.com slash twitcoding101. That's right. And if you're not into the G Plus groove, you can always find us on Twitter. I'm at twitter.com slash padresj. That's at padresj. And I am at snubs. Yeah. And finally, don't forget that you can watch us live each week, Thursdays, 1.30 p.m. Pacific time here oh, at live.twit.tv. Yeah, yeah. There's and people out there. There's people out there. And in, in fact, we can prove that there's people out there by going into our chat room. Hey, guys. Yeah, yeah. What's up? Find them at irc.twit.tv. It's one of the ways that we participate. You see us pulling questions out of the chat room. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's all Twit love. Until next time. I'm Father Robert Ballasare. I'm Shannon Morse. And uh, blind.